Edward the Seventh, a featured article from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Edward the Seventh, Albert Edward, born November 9, 1841, died May 6, 1910, was King of the United Kingdom and the British Dominions and Emperor of India from January 22, 1901 until his death. The eldest son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, Edward was related to royalty throughout Europe. Before his accession to the throne, he served as heir apparent and held the title of Prince of Wales for longer than any of his predecessors. During the long reign of his mother, he was largely excluded from political power and came to personify the fashionable, leisured elite. He traveled throughout Europe performing ceremonial public duties and representing Britain on visits abroad. His tours of North America in 1860 and the Indian subcontinent in 1875 were popular successes, but his reputation as a playboy prince soured his relationship with his mother. As king, Edward played a role in the modernization of the British home fleet and the reorganization of the British Empire Army after the Second Boer War. He reinstituted traditional ceremonies as public displays and broadened the range of people with whom royalty socialized. He fostered good relations between Britain and other countries, especially France, for which he was popularly called, quote, peacemaker, close quote. But his relationship with his nephew, Kaiser Wilhelm II, was poor. The Edwardian era, which covered Edward's reign and was named after him, coincided with the start of a new century and heralded significant changes in technology and society, including steam turbine propulsion and the rise of socialism. He died in 1910 in the midst of a constitutional crisis that was resolved the following year by the Parliament Act 1911, which restricted the powers of the unelected House of Lords. Section 1 early life and education. Edward was born at 1048 in the morning on November 9, 1841, in Buckingham Palace. He was the eldest son and second child of Queen Victoria and her husband and first cousin, Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. He was christened Albert Edward at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, on January 25, 1842. He was named Albert after his father and Edward after his maternal grandfather, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent and Strathairn. He was known as Bertie to the family throughout his life. As the eldest son of the British sovereign, he was automatically Duke of Cornwall and Duke of Rothesay at, his, at birth. As a son of Prince Albert, he also held the titles of Prince of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha and Duke of Saxony. He was created Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester on December 8, 1841, Earl of Dublin on January 17, 1850, a Knight of the Garter on November 9, 1858, and a Knight of the Thistle on, no on May 24, 1867. In 1863, he renounced his succession rights to the Duke of Sec Coburth and Gotha in favor of his younger brother, Prince Albert. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were determined that their eldest son should have an education that would prepare him to be a model constitutional monarch. At age seven, Edward embarked on a rigorous educational program devised by Prince Albert and supervised by several tutors. Unlike his elder, elder sister Victoria, Edward did not excel in his studies. He tried to meet the expectations of his parents, but to no avail. Although Edward was not a diligent student, his true talents were those of charm, sociability, and tact. Benjamin Disraeli described him as informed, intelligent, and of sweet manner. After an educational trip to Rome, undertaken in the first few months of 1859, he spent the summer of that year at the University of Edinburgh, amongst others, under, amongst others, the chemist Lyon Playfair. In October, he matriculated as an undergraduate at Christ Church, Oxford. Now released from the educational strictures imposed by his parents, he enjoyed studying for the first time 
and performed satisfactorily in examinations. In 1861, he transferred to Trinity College, Cambridge, where he was tutored in history by Charles Kingsley, Regis Professor of Modern History. Kingsley's efforts brought forth the best performances of Edward's life, and Edward actually looked forward to his lectures. Section 2. Early Adulthood in 1860, Edward undertook the first tour of North America by an heir to the British throne. His genial good humor and confident bonhomie made the tour a great success. He inaugurated the Victoria Bridge Montreal across the St. Lawrence River and laid the cornerstone of Parliament Hill, Ottawa. He watched Charles Blondin traverse Niagara Falls by high wire and stayed for three days with President James Buchanan at the White House. Buchanan accompanied the prince to Mount Vernon to pay his respects at the tomb of George Washington. Vast crowds greeted him everywhere. He met Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Robert Wa Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Oliver Wendell Holmes. Prayers for the royal family were said in Trinity Church, New York, for the first time since 1776. The four-month tour throughout Canada and the United States considerably boosted Edward's confidence and self-esteem, and had many diplomatic benefits for Great Britain. Edward had hoped to pursue a career in the British Army, but his mother vetoed an active military career. His ranks were honorary. He was gazetted a lieutenant colonel without experience or any examinations in 1858. In September 1861, Edward was sent to Germany, supposedly to watch military maneuvers, but actually in order to engineer a meeting between him and Princess Alexandra of Denmark, the eldest daughter of Prince Christian of Denmark and his wife Louise. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert had already decided that Edward and Alexandra should marry. They met at Spire on September 24th under the auspices of his eldest sister, Victoria, who had married the Crown Prince of Prussia in 1858. Edward's eldest, elder sister, acting upon instructions from their mother, had met Princess Alexandra in Strelitz in June. The young Danish princess made a very favorable impression. Edward and Alexandra were friendly from the start. The meeting went well for both sides, and marriage plans advanced. From this time, Edward gained a reputation as a playboy. Determined to get some army experience, Edward attended maneuvers in Ireland, during which he spent three nights with an actress, Nellie Clifton, who was hidden in the camp by his fellow officers. Prince a Albert, though ill, was appalled and visited Edward at Cambridge to issue a reprimand. Albert died in December 1861, just two weeks after the visit. Queen Victoria was inconsolable, wore mourning clothes for the rest of her life, and blamed Edward for his father's death. At first, she regarded her son with distaste as frivolous, indiscreet, and irresponsible. She wrote to her eldest daughter, quote, I never can or shall look at him without a shudder, Closed quote. Section 3. Marriage Once widowed, Queen Victoria effectively withdrew from public life. Shortly after Prince Albert's death, she arranged for Edward to embark on an extensive tour of the Middle East, visiting Egypt, Jerusalem, Damascus, Beirut, and Constantinople. In part political, the British government wanted Edward to secure the friendship of Egypt's ruler, Said Pasha, to prevent French control of the Suez Canal if the Ottoman Empire collapsed. It was the first royal tour on which an official photographer, Francis Bedford, was in attendance. As soon as Edward returned to Britain, preparations were made for his engagement, which was set, sealed at Lacan in Belgium on September 9, 1862. Edward married Princess Alexandra of Denmark at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, on March 10, 1863. He was 21, she was 18. Edward and his wife established Marlborough House as their London residence and Sandringham House in Norfolk as their country retreat. They entertained on a lavish scale. Their marriage met with disapproval in certain circles because most of Queen Victoria's relations were German, and Denmark was at loggerheads with Germany over the territories of Schleswig and Holstein. 
when Alexandra's father inherited the throne of Denmark in November of 1863, the German Confederation took the opportunity to invade and annex Schleswig-Holstein. Queen Victoria was of two minds whether it was a suitable match given the political climate. After the couple's marriage, she expressed anxiety about their socialite lifestyle and attempted to dictate to them on various matters, including the names of their children. Edward had mistresses throughout his married life. He socialized with actress Lily Langtree, Lady Randolph Churchill, born Jenny Jerome, she was the mother of Winston Churchill, Daisy Greville, Countess of Warwick, actress Sarah Bernhardt, noblewoman Lady Suzanne Vane Tempest, singer Hortense Schneider, prostitute Julia Benini, known as La Barucci, wealthy humanitarian Agnes Kaiser, and Alice Keppel. At least 55 liaisons are conjectured. How far these relationships went is not always clear. Edward always strove to be discreet, but this did not prevent society gossip or press speculation. One of Alice Keppel's great-granddaughters, Camilla Parker Bowles, became the mistress and subsequently wife of Charles, Prince of Wales, one of Edward's great-great-grandsons. It was r rumored that Camilla's grandmother, Sonia Keppel, born in May 1900, was the illegitimate daughter of Edward, but she was, quote, almost certainly, close quote, the daughter of George Keppel, whom she resembled. Edward never acknowledged any illegitimate children. Alexandra is believed to have been aware of many of his affairs and to have accepted them. In 1869, Sir Charles Mordaunt, a British Member of Parliament, threatened to name Edward as co-respondent in his divorce suit. Ultimately, he did not do so, but Edward was called as a witness in the case in early 1870. It was shown that Edward had visited the Mordaunt's house while Sir Charles was away sitting in the House of Commons. Although nothing further was proven, and Edward denied he had committed adultery, the suggestion of impropriety was damaging. Section 4. Heir Apparent During Queen Victoria's widowhood, Edward pioneered the idea of royal public appearances as we understand them t today. For example, opening Thames Embankment in 1871, Mercy Tunnel in 1886, and Tower Bridge in 1894. However, his mother did not allow Edward an active role in the running of the country until 1898. He was sent summaries of important government documents, but she refused to give him access to the originals. He annoyed his mother by siding with Denmark on the Schleswig-Holstein question in 1864. She was pro-German and in the same year annoyed her again by making a special effort to meet Giuseppe Garibaldi. Liberal Prime Minister William Ewart Gladstone sent him papers secretly. In 1870, Republican sentiment in Britain was given a boost when the French Emperor, Napoleon III, was defeated in the Franco-Prussian War and the French Third Republic was declared. However, in the winter of 1871, a brush with death led to an improvement in both Edward's popularity with the public and his relationship with his mother. While staying at Londonsboro Lodge, near Scarborough, North Yorkshire, Edward contracted typhoid, the disease that was believed to have killed his father. There was great national concern, and one of his fellow guests, Lord Chesterfield, died. Edward's recovery was greeted with almost universal relief. Public celebrations including, included the composition of Arthur Sullivan's Festival to Dome. Edward cultivated politicians from all parties, including Republicans, as his friends, and thereby largely dissipated any residual feelings against him. From 1886, Foreign Secretary, Secretary Lord Rosebery sent him Foreign Office dispatches, and from 1892, some cabinet papers were open to him. In October 1875, Edward set off for India on an extensive eight-month tour of the subcontinent. His advisors remarked on his habit of treating all people the same, regardless of their social station or color. In letters home, he complained of the treatment of the native Indians by the British officials, quote, 
because a man has a black face and a different religion from our own, there is no reason why he should be treated as a brute, close quote. At the end of the tour, his mother was given the title Empress of India by Parliament, in part as a result of the tour's success. Edward was a patron of the arts and sciences, and helped found the Royal College of Music. He opened the college in 1883 with the words, quote, Class can no longer stand apart from class. I claim for music that it produces that union of feeling which I much desire to promote, close quote. At the same time, he enjoyed gambling and country sports and was an enthusiastic hunter. He ordered all the clocks at Sandringham to run half an hour ahead to provide more daylight for shooting. This so-called tradition of Sandringham time continued until 1936, when it was abolished by Edward VIII. He also laid out a golf course at Windsor. By the 1870s, the future king had taken a keen interest in horse racing and steeple chasing. In 1896, his horse Persimmon won both the Derby Stakes and the St. Ledger Stakes. In 1900, Persimmon's brother, Diamond Jubilee, won five races, Derby, St. Ledger, 2000's Guinea Stakes, New Market Stakes, and Eclipse Stakes. And another of Edward's horses, Ambush II, won the Grand National. He was regarded worldwide as an arbiter of men's fashions. He made wearing tweed, Homburg hats, and Norfolk jackets fashionable, and popularized the wearing of black ties with dinner jackets instead of white tie and tails. He pioneered the pressing of trouser legs from side to side in preference to the now normal front and back creases, and was thought to have introduced the stand-up turned-down shirt collar. A stickler for proper dress, he is said to have admonished the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, for wearing the trousers of an elder brother of Trinity House with a privy councillor's coat. Deep in an international crisis, the Prime Minister informed the Prince of Wales that it had been a dark morning and that, quote, my mind must have been occupied by some subject of less importance, closed quote. The tradition of men not buttoning the bottom button of waistcoats is said to have is said to be linked to Edward, who supposedly left his undone because of his large girth. His waist measured forty eight inches, a hundred and twenty two centimeters, shortly before his coronation. He introduced the practice of eating roast beef, roast potatoes, horseradish sauce, and Yorkshire pudding on Sundays which remains a staple British favorite for Sunday lunch. In 1891, Edward was embroiled in the Royal Baccarat scandal. When it, was, when it was revealed, he had played an illegal card game for money the previous year. The prince was forced to appear as a witness in court for a second time, when one of the players unsuccessfully sued his fellow players for slander after being accused of cheating. In the same year, Edward was involved in a personal conflict when Lord Charles Beresford threatened to reveal details of Edward's private life to the press as a protest against Edward interfering with Beresford's affair with Daisy Greville, Countess of Warwick. The friendship between the men was irreversibly damaged, and their bitterness would last for the remainder of their lives. Usually, Edward's outbursts of temper were short-lived, and, quote, after he had let himself go, he would smooth matters by being especially nice, close quote. In late 1891, Edward's eldest son, Albert Victor, was engaged to Princess Victoria Mary of Teck. Just a few weeks later, in early 1892, Albert Victor died of pneumonia. Edward was grief-stricken, quote, to lose our eldest son, close quote, he wrote, quote, is one of those calamities one can never really get over, closed quote. Edward told Victoria, quote, I would have given my life for him, as I put no value on mine, closed quote. Albert Victor was the second of Edward's children to die. In 1871, his youngest son, John, had died, died just 24 hours after being born. Edward had insisted on placing John in his coffin, personally with, quote, the tears rolling down his cheeks, close quote. On his way to Denmark through Belgium on April 4, 1900, Edward was the victim of an attempted assassination, 
when 15-year-old Jean-Baptiste Cepido shot at him in protest over the Boer War. Cepido, although obviously guilty, was acquitted by a Belgian court because he was underage. The perceived laxity of the Belgian authorities, combined with British disgust at Belgian atrocities in the Congo, worsened the already poor relationship between the United Kingdom and the continent. However, in the next ten years, Edward's affability and popularity, as well as his use of family connections, assisted Britain in building European alliances. Section 5. Accession When Queen Victoria died on January 22, 1901, Edward became King of the United Kingdom, Emperor of India, and, in an innovation, King of the British Dominions. He chose to reign under the name Edward VII instead of Albert Edward, the name his mother had intended for him to use, declaring that he did not wish to, quote, undervalue the name of Albert, close quote, and diminish the status of his father, with whom the, quote, name would stand alone, close quote. The number seven was occasionally admitted in Scotland, even by the National Church, in deference to protests that the previous Edwards were English kings who had, quote, been excluded from Scotland by battle, close quote. J.B. Priestley recalled, quote, I was only a child when he succeeded Victoria in 1901, but I can testify to his extraordinary popularity. He was, in fact, the most popular king England had known since the earlier 1660s, close quote. He donated his parents' house, Osborne on the Isle of Wight, to the state and continued to live at Sandringham. He could afford to be magnanimous. His private secretary, Sir Francis Knollys, claimed that he was the first heir to succeed to the throne in credit. Edward's finances had been ably managed by Sir Dighton Proben, comptroller of the household, and had benefited from advice from Edward's Jewish financier friends, such as Ernest Castle, Maurice de Hirsch, and the Rothschild family. At a time of widespread anti-Semitism, Edward attracted criticism for openly socializing with Jews. Edward VII was crowned at Westminster Abbey on August 9, 1902, by the 80-year-old Archbishop of Canterbury, Frederick Temple, who died only four months later. The coronation had originally been scheduled for June 26, but two days before, on June 24, Edward was diagnosed with appendicitis. Appendicitis was generally not treated operatively and carried a high mortality rates, but developments in anesthesia and antiseptics in the preceding 50 years made life-saving surgery possible. Sir Frederick Treves, with the support of Lord Lister, perverted, performed a then radical operation of draining the infected abscess through a small incision. The next day, Edward was sitting up in bed smoking a cigar. Two weeks later, it was announced that the king was out of danger. Treves was honored with a baronetcy, which Edward had arranged before the operation, and appendix surgery entered the medical mainstream. Edward refurbished the royal palaces, reintroduced the traditional ceremonies, such as the state opening of Parliament, that his mother had foregone, and founded new orders of honors, such as the Order of Merit, to recognize contributions to the arts and sciences. In 1902, the Shah of Persia, Mozaffar al-Din, visited England, expecting to receive the Order of the Garter. Edward refused to give this high honor to the Shah because the Order was meant to be his personal gift, and the Foreign Secretary, Lord Lansdowne, had promised the Order without his consent. Edward also objected to inducting a Muslim into a Christian Order of Chivalry. His refusal threatened to damage British attempts to gain influence in Persia, but Edward resented his minister's attempts to reduce the king's traditional powers. Eventually he relented, and Britain sent a special embassy to the Shah with a full order of the Garter the following year. Section 6. Uncle of Europe As king, Edward's main interests lay in the fields of foreign affairs and naval and military matters. Fluent in French and German, he made a number of visits abroad and took annual holidays at Biritz and Marinbad. One of his most important foreign trips was an official visit to France in May 1903 as the, president, as the guest of President Emile Lubet. Following a visit to the Pope in Rome, 
This trip helped create the atmosphere for the Anglo-French French Entente Cordiale, an agreement delineating Br British and French colonies in North Africa and ruling out any future war between the two countries. The Entente was negotiated between the French Foreign Minister Theophile de, Cl de Classe and the British Foreign Secretary Lord Lansdowne, signed in London on April 8, 1904, by Lansdowne and the French Ambassador Paul Cambon. It marked the end of centuries of Anglo-French rivalry and Britain's splendid isolation from continental affairs, and attempted to counterbalance the growing dominance of the English of the German Empire and its ally, Austria-Hungary. Edward was related to, to nearly every other European monarch and came to be known as the, quote, uncle of Europe, close quote. Kaiser Wilhelm II was his nephew. Tsar Nicholas II was his nephew by marriage. Queen Victoria Eugenia of Spain, Crown Princess Margaret of Sweden, Crown P Princess Marie of Romania, Crown Princess Sophia of Greece, and Empress Alexandra of Russia were his nieces. Hakan VII of Norway was both his nephew by marriage and his son-in-law. George I of Greece and Frederick VIII of Denmark were his brothers-in-law. Albert I of Belgium, Ferdinand of Bulgaria, and Charles I and Manuel II of Portugal were his second cousins. Edward doted on his grandchildren and indulged them to the consternation of their governesses. However, there was one relation whom Edward did not like. Wilhelm II. Edward's difficult relationship with his nephew exacerbated the tensions between Germany and Britain. In April 1908, during Edward's annual stay at Baritz, he accepted the resignation of British Prime Minister Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman. In a break with precedent, Edward asked Campbell Bannerman's successor, H. H. Asquith, to travel with to Baritz to kiss hands. Asquith complied, but the press criticized the action of the king in appointing a prime minister on foreign soil instead of returning to Britain. In June 1908, Edward became the first reigning British monarch to visit the Russian Empire, despite refusing to visit in 1906, when Anglo-Russian relations were strained in the aftermath of the Russo-Japanese War, the Dogger Bank incident, and the Tsar's dissolution of the Duma. The previous month, Edward visited the Scandinavian countries, becoming the first British monarch to visit Sweden. Section 7. Political Opinions Edward involved himself heavily in discussions over army reform, the need for which had become apparent with the failings of the Second Boer War. He supported the redesign of army command, the creation of the territorial force, and the decision to provide an expeditionary force supporting France in the event of war with Germany. Reform of the Royal Navy was also suggested, partly due to the ever-increasing naval estimates, and because of the emergence of the Imperial German Navy as a new strategic threat. Ultimately, a dispute arose between Admiral Lord Charles Beresford, who favored increased spending and a broad deployment, and the First Sea Lord Admiral Sir John Fisher, who favored efficiency savings, scrapping obsolete vessels, and a strategic realignment of the Royal Navy, relying on torpedo craft for home de defense, backed by the new dreadnoughts. The king lent support, lent support to Fisher, in part because he disliked Beresford, and eventually Beresford was dismissed. Beresford continued his campaign outside the Navy, and Fisher ultimately announced his resignation in 1909, although the bulk of his policies were retained. The king was intimately involved in the appointment of Fisher's successor, as the Fisher-Beresford feud had split the service, and the only truly qualified figure known to be outside of both camps was Sir Arthur Nett Wilson, who had retired in 1907. Wilson was reluctant to return to active duty, but Edward persuaded him to do so, and Wilson became first sea lord on January 25, 1910. As Prince of Wales, Edward had come to enjoy warm and mutually respectful relations with W. E. Gladstone, whom his mother detested. Both Glad but Gladstone's son, Home Secretary Herbert Gladstone, angered the king by planning to permit Roman Catholic priests' investments 
to carry the host through the streets of London, and by appointing two ladies, Lady Frances Balfour and Mrs. H. J. Tennant, to serve on a royal commission on reforming divorce law. Edward thought divorce could not be discussed with, quote, delicacy or even decency, close quote, before ladies. Edward's biographer Philip Magnus suggests that Gladstone may have become a whipping boy for the king's general irritation with the liberal government. Gladstone was sacked in the reshuffle in the following year, and the king agreed, with some reluctance, to appoint him governor general of South Africa. Edward was rarely introduced interested in politics, although his views on some issues were notably liberal for the time. During his reign, he said the use of the word nigger was, quote, disgraceful, close quote, despite it then being in common parlance. While Prince of Wales, he had to be dissuaded from breaking with constitutional precedent by openly voting for Gladstone's representation of the People Bill, 1884, in the House of Lords. On other matters, he was less progressive. He did not, for example, favor giving votes to women although he did suggest that the social reformer Octavia Hill serve on the Commission for Working Class Housing. He was also opposed to Irish home rule, instead preferring a form of dual monarchy. Edward lived a life of luxury that was often far removed from that of the majority of his subjects. However, his personal charm with people at all levels of society and his strong condemnation of prejudice went some way to assuage Republican and racial tensions building during his lifetime. Section 8. Constitutional Crisis In the last year of his life, Edward became embroiled in a constitutional crisis when the conservative majority in the House of Lords refused to pass the, quote, people's budget, close quote, proposed by the liberal government of Prime Minister H. H. Asquith. The crisis eventually led, after Edward's death, to the removal of the Lord's right to veto legislation. The king was displeased at liberal attacks on the peers, which included a polemic speech by David Lloyd George in Limehouse, at Limehouse. Cabinet Minister Winston Churchill publicly demanded a general election, for which Asquith apologized to the king's adviser, Lord Knollis, and rebuked Churchill at a cabinet meeting. Edward was so depressed at the tone of class warfare, although Asquith told him that party rancor had been just as bad over the first Home Rule Bill in 1886, that he introduced his son to Secretary of State for War Richard Haldane as, quote, the last King of England, close quote. After the King's horse, Minaru, won the Derby on July 26, 1909, he returned to the racetrack the following day and laughed when a man shouted, quote, Now, King, you've won the Derby. Go back home and dissolve this bloody Parliament, close quote. In vain, the King urged Conservative leaders Arthur Balfour and Lord Lansdowne to pass the budget, which Lord Escher had advised him was not unusual, as Queen Victoria had helped to broker agreements between the two houses over Irish disestablishment in 1869 and the Third Reform Act in 1884. On Asquith's advice, however, he did not offer them an election, at which, to judge from recent by-elections, they were likely to gain seats, as a reward for doing so. The Finance Bill passed the Commons on November 5, 1909, but it was rejected by the Lords on November 30th. They instead passed a resolution of Lord Lansdowne, stating that they were entitled to oppose the bill, as it lacked an electoral mandate. The king was annoyed that his efforts to urge passage of the budget had become public knowledge, and had forbidden his adviser, Lord Knollis, who was an active liberal peer, from voting for the budget, although Knollis had suggested that this would be a suitable gesture to indicate royal desire to see the budget pass. In December of 1909, a proposal to create peers, to give the liberals a majority in the Lords, or give the Prime Minister the right to do so, was considered, quote, outrageous, close quote, by Knollis, who thought the king should abdicate rather than agree to it. The January 1910 election was dominated by talk of removing the Lord's veto. During the election campaign, Lloyd George talked of, quote, guarantees, close quote, and asked with of, quote, safeguards, close quote, that would be necessary before forming another liberal government. 
but the king informed Asquith that he would not be willing to contemplate creating peers until after a second general election. Balfour refused to be drawn on whether or not he would be willing to form a conservative government, but advised the king not to promise to create peers until he had seen the terms of any proposed constitutional claim. During the campaign, the leading conservative, Walter Long, had asked Nallis for permission to state that the king did not favor Irish home rule, but Nallis refused, as it was not appropriate for the monarch's views to be known in public. The election resulted in a hung parliament, which, with the liberal government dependent on the support of the largest, of the third largest party, the Irish nationalists. The king suggested a compromise, whereby only fifty peers from each side would be allowed to vote, which would also redress the large conservative majority in the Lords. But Lord Crewe, liberal leader in the Lords, advised that this would reduce the Lords' independence, as only peers who were loyal party supporters would be picked. Pressure to remove the Lords' veto now came from the Irish Nationalists' MPs, who wanted to remove the Lords' ability to block the introduction of Irish Home Rule. They threatened to vote against the budget unless they had their way. An attempt by Lord George to win their support by amending whiskey duties was abandoned as the cabinet felt this would recast the budget too much. Asquith now revealed that there were no, quote, guarantees, close quote, for the creation of peers. The cabinet considered resigning and leaving it up to Balfour to try to form a conservative government. The king's speech from the throne on February 21st made reference to introducing measures restricting the Lord's power of veto to one of delay, but Asquith inserted a phrase, quote, in the opinion of my advisers, close quote, so the king could be seen to be distancing himself from the planned legislation. The Commons passed resolutions on April 14th that would form the basis for the Parliament Act to remove the power of the Lords to veto money bills, to replace their veto of other bills with a power to delay, and to reduce the term of Parliament from seven years to five, the King would have preferred four. But in that debate, Asquith hinted, to ensure the support of the Nationalists MPs, that he would ask the King to break the deadlock, quote, in that Parliament, close quote, i.e., contrary to Edward's earlier stipulation, that there be a second election. The budget was passed by both Commons and Lords in April. By April, the palace was having secret talks with Balfour and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who both advised that the Liberals did not have sufficient mandate to demand the creation of peers. The King thought the whole proposal simply disgusting, and that the government was, quote, in the hands of Redmond and Company, close quote. Lord Crewe announced publicly that the government's wish to create peers should be treated as formal, quote, ministerial advice, close quote, which by convention the monarch must obey, although Lord Escher argued that the monarch was entitled in extremis to dismiss the government rather than take their, quote, advice, close quote. Escher's view has been called, quote, obsolete and unhelpful, close quote. Section 9. Death. Edward habitually smoked 20 cigarettes and 12 cigars a day. Towards the end of his life, he increasingly suffered from bronchitis. He suffered a momentary loss of consciousness during a state visit to Berlin in February 1909. In March 1910, the king was staying at Bayeritz when he collapsed. He remained there to convalesce, while in London, Asquith tried to get the finance bill passed. The king's continued ill health was unreported, and he attracted criticism for staying in France while political tensions were so high. On April 27th, he returned to Buckingham Palace, still suffering from severe bronchitis. Alexandra returned from visiting her brother, King George I of Greece in Corfu, a week later on May 5th. The following day, the king suffered several heart attacks, but refused to go to bed saying, quote, no, I shall not give in, I shall go on, I shall work to the end, closed quote. Between moments of faintness, the Prince of Wales, shortly to be King George V, told him that his horse, Witch of the Air, had won at Kempton Park that afternoon. The king replied, quote, yes, I have heard of it, I am very glad, closed quote. 
his final words. At 11.30 p.m., he lost consciousness for the last time and was put to bed. He died 15 minutes later. Edward VII was buried at St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, on May 20, 1910. As Barbara Tuchman noted in The Guns of August, his funeral quote, marked, quote, the greatest assemblage of royalty and rank ever gathered in one place and, of its kind, the last, closed quote. Section 10, Legacy. Statues of Edward can be found throughout the former empire, such as those in Waterloo Place, London, Centenary Square, Birmingham, Union Street, Aberdeen, Queen's Park, Toronto, Phillips Square, Montreal, North Terrace, Adelaide, Franklin Square, Hobart, and outside the Royal Botanic Gardens, Sydney. Before his accession to the throne, Edward was the longest serving heir apparent in British history until surpassed by his great great grandson, Charles, Prince of Wales, on April 22, 2011. As the title Prince of Wales is not exactly coincident with the position of heir apparent, he remains the longest serving holder of that title at 59 years, 45 days. Charles has held the title for 55 years, 353 days. As king, Edward VII provided a greater success than anyone had expected, but he was already an old man and had little time left to fulfill the role. In his short reign, he ensured that his second son and heir, George V, was better prepared to take the throne. Contemporaries describe their relationship as more like affectionate brothers than father and son, and on Edward's death, George wrote in his diary that he had lost, quote, best friend and the best of fathers. I never had a cross word with him in my life. I am heartbroken and overwhelmed with grief, close quote. Edward was lauded as, quote, peacemaker, close quote, but had been afraid that his nephew, the German emperor, Wilhelm II, would tip Europe into war. Four years after Edward's death, World War I broke out. The naval reforms he had supported and his part in securing the Triple Entente between Britain, France, and Russia, as well as his relationships with his extended family, fed the paranoia of the German Empire, who blamed Edward for the war. Publication of the official biography of Edward was delayed by its author, Sidney Lee, who feared German propagandists would select material to portray Edward as an anti-German warmonger. Lee was also hampered by the extensive destruction of Edward's personal papers. Edward had left orders that all his letters should be burned on his death. Subsequent biographers had been able to construct a more rounded picture of Edward by using material and sources that were unavailable to Lee. Edward received criticism for his apparent pursuit of self-indulgent pleasure, but he received great praise for his affable and kind manners and his diplomatic skill. As his grandson wrote, quote, his lighter side obscured the fact that he had both insight and influence, closed quote. Quote, he had a tremendous zest for pleasure, but he also had a real sense of duty, closed quote, wrote J.B. Priestley. Lord Escher wrote that Edward was, quote, kind and debonair and not undignified, but too human, closed quote. Section 11. Title, Styles, Honors, and Arms. Section 11.1, .1, Titles and Styles. From November 9th to December 8th, 1841, His Royal Highness, the Duke of Cornwall, and Rothesay. From April 8th, from December 8th, 1841, to January 22nd, 1901, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. From January 17th, 1850, to January 22nd, 1901, the Earl of Dublin. From January 2nd, 22nd, 1901, to May 6th, 1910, His Majesty the King. With regard to India, His Imperial Majesty, the King Emperor. Section 11.2, Honors, British Honors. Knight of the Order of the Garter, Knight Com Companion of the Order of the Star of India, Fellow of the Royal Society, Member of the Privy Council of the United Kingdom, Knight Cross of the Order of the Bath, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Star of India, Knight of the Order of the Thistle, Knight of the Order of St. Patrick, Member of the Privy Council of Ireland, 
Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of the Indian Empire, Knight Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order, and Great Master of the Order of the Bath, Foreign Honors, Knight of the Order of the Golden Fleece of Spain, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Tower and Sword of Portugal, N Grand Officer of the Legion of Honor of France, Knight of the Order of the Seraphim of Sweden, Knight of the Order of the Black Eagle of Prussia, Knight of the Order of St. Andrew of Russia, Grand Cross of the Order of St. Olav of Norway, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of Charles III of Spain, Grand Commander of the Order of Danibrog of Denmark, Grand Cross of the Order of the Star of Ethiopia. 11, section 11.3 Arms As Prince of Wales, Edward's coat of arms was the royal arms differenced by a label of three points argent and an enchutican of the shield of Saxony representing his father. When he acceded as king, he gained the royal arms undifferenced. Section 12 Issue Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avondale, born January 8, 1864, died January 14, 1892, engaged in 1891 to Pr Princess Mary of Teck. George V, born June 3, 1865, died January 20, 1936, married 1893, Princess Mary of Teck, had issue. Louise, Princess Royale, born February 20, 1867, died January 4, 1931, married 1889, Alexander Duff, first Duke of Fife, had issue. Princess Victoria, born July 6, 1868, died December 3, 1935. Princess Maud, born November 26, 1869, died November 20, 1938, married 1896, Hakon VII of Norway, had issue. Prince Alexander John of Wales, born April 6, 1871, died April 7, 1871. This sound file and all text in this article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 Unported License, available at creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by hyphen sa forward slash three period zero.